everyone, and welcome back to the Tech Policy Grind. It's the end of 2022 already, and it's been a long year, but also a really fun and exciting one for the Foundry. So to recap it all, I'm here with a lineup of some familiar faces, uh, familiar voices maybe, from the show this year. So Mary Bagdasarian, who is a technology and human rights attorney from Armenia. Hi, Rima. Hi, guys. And we have Joe Catapano, who is a stakeholder engagement senior manager at ICANN. Hey, everyone. And last but not least, Lama Mohammed, who is an associate at the Glen Echo Group which is a DC-based public relations and communications agency that specializes in tech policy. Hi, everyone. Again, so happy to be here. Thanks for hosting us, Rima. Yeah, and I guess <laughs> to intro myself, I'm Rima. I'm currently a law student at the University of Southern California um, and also a Foundry Fellow along with all these wonderful folks. So if you've been listening for a while, you might have gotten to hear our various interviews with other Foundry Fellows or various practitioners from our respective industries. But we wanted to take this opportunity to let you get to know us a little bit more and to hear our thoughts on what being a Foundry Fellow has actually looked like. So to get us started, should we just go around and share a bit about our backgrounds and how we got into tech policy and how we found the Foundry? So I am a recent graduate from the American University, Go Eagles. Um, I graduated in May 2021. Um, and when I was a freshman in college, like every other DC wonk, I wanted to do international human rights. Um, and then my freshman year, I watched Mark Zuckerberg testify before the Senate committee um, for the very first time. And that was sort of my introduction into tech policy, because I was looking at these two groups of people interacting and I went, there's a huge disconnect between these two people. What if I did tech policy? And everyone around me was like, you're crazy. That what? That's no such thing. Like, you're never going to get a job. What is tech policy? And I was like, AI is coming. Just wait. And lo and behold, here we are, like four years later, and everyone's talking about data privacy, algorithm accountability, and it's very exciting. So in between sort of that timeline, I was trying really hard to look for things and organizations and opportunities that would allow me to sort of jumpstart my career in tech policy. And that's sort of when I found the Foundry. Um, I had done a policy hackathon at Carnegie Mellon Heinz College through the PPIA Fellowship Program, and someone at that organization introduced me to the Foundry. And I actually competed in 2020, which was when the Foundry started doing their annual policy hackathons. And I am very happy to say that I won second place. We did a broadband proposal that sort of worked to bring internet accessibility to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks. Um, and so that was a really great learning opportunity. And that was sort of my first introduction to the Foundry. Um, and then following that hackathon, that sort of funneled many other opportunities for me. And so that's where I found, you know, the Glen Echo Group, where I was an intern my senior year, and I was thankfully hired right after college, which is where I currently work. Um, winning the hackathon allowed me to sort of help my uh, application when I applied to the Foundry. I'm very happy to say that I'm now a fellow, and I've met all of you all. Um, and I'm also a volunteer at All Tech is Human, which is a fantastic nonprofit in New York that sort of is working to build um, the socially responsible ecosystem around the world. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my background. It's a little non-traditional, but everyone in tech policy is non-traditional, so it's a great space to be in. Yeah, when I was listening to Lama, I also remember those conversations with people um, when I was telling that I want to be a human rights attorney and they were like, oh, where we are going to work. That's so non-conventional. It will be so hard, et cetera, et cetera. But somehow it worked out. Uh, so as Rima mentioned in the intro, I am a technology and human rights attorney from Armenia, but I started out um, as a 
more generally student rights attorney, mostly doing international human rights litigation and being a consultant for international organizations. Then I very accidentally found myself in internet governance uh, and never left uh, because I fell in love with all the issues and all the communities I have the privilege to work with. Um, so um, I worked a lot in the European context and became more curious around the US law perspective on um, tech law and policy issues. And uh, in 2020, I moved to US and started my second master's at University of Pennsylvania Law School. And that's when I met the foundry again through uh, the hackathon as Lama. Um, it was very intense. It was my very first policy hackathon. So the experience itself was very interesting. Uh, I will not say the issue resonated uh, well with me, but I really appreciated the experience um, and I love my team. And then um, after that, a lot of people uh, started telling me that I need to you know, be on the lookout for the application round to uh, get involved with the foundry because of my, you know, global and comparative perspective. It will be really cool to network with people in US and not only. Um, so I just was curious uh, what the foundry will be, you know, in action. So I was really happy that um, I saw the application round last year. I think it was around this time and, um, you know, definitely didn't want to miss the opportunity to uh, be more connected uh, with the activities and find more communities that can resonate with me um, as I now live in the United States. Um, and besides, you know, the foundry, I am a um, member of different internet governance um, communities. Uh, I am on steering committee of the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition, which is a, um, a network of human rights advocates and human rights organizations trying to make uh, human rights effective uh, also in the online domain um, and um, generally trying to uh, make uh, youth voices more vocal in internet governance. And um, now as I'm based in US, I think um, my goal for the future is to make tech policy in US not so US centric. We may talk about this a lot, um, but I feel like there is huge need for this. Um, and I'm really happy to bring everything I've learned so far and continue learning with uh, you all here to make that happen. Yeah, really excited for what the Foundry has um, in store for us uh, moving forward. Yeah, so uh, we're uh, at least 50% AU Eagles here, which is awesome. <laughs> um, I am the graduate class of 09. So um, yeah, I've been kicking around for a while. Uh, so I, like, I think most people in 2012, I didn't really know what the hell tech policy was. Um, I didn't put a lot of thought into how the internet works i much like most other people turned the machine on and it worked and that was just fine for me um but i was working at the united nations foundation uh in public affairs and pr uh, communications and one of the projects that i was put on was to support the international telecommunications union in the promotion of what is familiarly called the Wicket meeting, which is the World Conference on International Telecommunications, I think. And it wasn't, it was more raising awareness of the meeting that it was happening, that there were important issues that were being discussed, and here's how you can follow it, and here's how you can be involved, and that type of thing. It was a very small sliver of my portfolio at the foundation. Most of my work was in US UN relations, but I found it interesting. Um, and I found myself kind of going down the rabbit hole of the meeting and really getting into it uh, more than I had, I had thought uh, at the time and started to learn about, you know, different standards bodies and how they make this whole thing work. That's how I learned that ICANN existed and, um, you know, served an important function. And I think, you know, the, the, commi the community that, that is listening to this podcast and is in this kind of universe uh, knows that, that the Wicked 2012 meeting was uh, 
uh, challenging, we'll be put it politely. Um, but the drama was certainly interesting and it certainly, you know, was galvanized my interest in the field. And then, you know, a year later I found my way to ICANN. So I've been working in the internet governance space since 2013. Um, I've had lots of interaction with the internet education foundation, which obviously the foundry is, is kind of under that, um, you know, kind of umbrella, if you will, there were several old pub trivia nights, which are, you know, were always popular that I remember going to. And, um, you know, so I've kind of been, you know, interacting with other past foundry fellows for, for a lot of my career at ICANN. And uh, the fellowship is always something that really interested me and, and was something I always, you know, was, was hoping that I could be involved in. Uh, it's given me an opportunity to work on a lot of different aspects of tech policy that I wouldn't otherwise be able to work on, right? So ICANN's kind of, you know, remit is pretty narrow and the subject matter we work on is, you know, relegated to the unique identifiers of the internet. But there's a whole world of tech policy that, you know, we don't touch that, you know, I'm able to kind of interact with uh, at the Foundry, which is great. And, you know, for me, just my experience now, it's but we're almost a year into it, roughly. You know, I think the the interesting part about the Foundry Fellowship, and I think one of the real cool things about it is it is what the fellows make of it. There's not a lot of hierarchy to it. There's not a lot of, you know, someone coming in from on high saying you can't do this, you can't do that, that type of thing, right? There's, you know, within reason, of course, but there's a lot of leeway for young professionals to get involved here and really kind of make make their own experience and expose, uh, you know, the broader tech policy community to to not only, you know, our skills as fellows, but, but the subject matter of the day. So... Uh, it's been great. I'm looking forward to what happens next. Me too. And thanks everyone for for sharing. It's so interesting because I hear all the time that there is no path in, in tech policy. And Lama, you mentioned that earlier. Uh, and I agree. But there's also lots of nuggets of similarity between people's experience and um, where their paths may have crossed um, or just missed each other by by a hair in the past. My experience is, you know, I'm a SoCal native. Tech policy is uh, a foreign concept to a lot of the the communities I grew up in. But I was always driven by an interest in the international sphere and human rights. Uh, so I ended up during undergrad doing a study abroad program in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, where I thought, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, learn all about the human rights ecosystem and whatnot, but ended up uh, getting a gig at the ITU, which Joe uh, mentioned earlier. And that was my first real entry into the world of tech policy. I was an intern there for a few months. Um, and from there became fascinated with the world of AI and cybersecurity in particular. So when I went back to UC Santa Barbara, where I was doing my undergrad, I started working for the cybersecurity office and had some great mentors who were technologists. It was the um, chief information security officer, the CISO, uh, and the associate CISO who were my mentors and taught me everything I know about um, how cybersecurity works and, and its foundations. Um, and I had the opportunity to go to conferences and meet people. And I went to one day of uh, the RSA conference back in February 2020 and remember meeting Camille Stewart, who was a part of the inaugural class of Foundry Fellows. Um, and she really kind of opened the door for me in seeing that, you know, there is a career that exists at the intersection of law, policy, and cybersecurity and tech issues. Um, so she told me about the Foundry, about another group called Women in Cybersecurity, or WESIS for short, 
um, another group as well called WCAPS. And then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think it was one of those silver lining things where, you know, even being based in SoCal, the fact that everyone was virtual meant that this sort of world opened up for virtual connectivity. Um, and the foundry already had been pretty decentralized and whatnot. So I was following the work of the foundry, um, you know, waiting anxiously for for the time that uh, things would open up. And, you know, it's been about two years uh, since then, but it's crazy. Time goes fast and a lot of things happen. I ended up sticking around at UCSB doing a master's degree in technology management where uh, I collaborated with a lot of engineers and technologists to um, get an understanding of project management, product development, and leadership uh, in innovation. And then at the same time, went back to ITU and was consulting on the Girls in ICT project that they're running out of there, uh, which was a big passion project of mine, and started law school. Um, got really into the field of cyber and privacy law, uh, which has culminated <laughs> to this point um, in me interning at the Future of Privacy Forum, uh, which is wrapping up uh, this month and also uh, will be digging back into the world of internet governance um, when I head over to the ICANN 76 community forum, um, where I will be hanging out with Joe and <laughs> Mary, um, as Mary and I are both fellows representing uh, the United States. So yeah, the, the Foundry has been incredibly impactful. I mean, this podcast has uh, given me so much, um, so much opportunity, has allowed me to have of incredible conversations with people and also to collaborate with all of you wonderful folks um, in in these projects, but also other other projects of the foundry, which we're going to dig into more uh, throughout this episode. But yeah, I, I think it's so interesting um, that there is really not a set path, but lots of different opportunities out there to take advantage of. Um, and, you know, it is this world where we have these crossing intersecting paths or um, have worked with each other's organizations, if not across the table at the same time, um, then maybe perhaps in the future we will. Yeah, I definitely think uh, non-conventional career paths require a bit more courage because definitely you are very discouraged from the start to take uh, that journey um, because there are a lot of uh, unknowns and a lot of uncertainty. But I think also understanding your passions and what you really care for is the you know, foundation of having a successful career. Um, and then, you know, that will drive you further than if you choose a safer option. Um, so I'm really um, glad that we all <laughs> found the courage <laughs> to follow what we found that we are more passionate about. Um, I'll also add that, you know, the ability to sort of jumpstart into a sort of unconventional career path is also an incredible privilege. And I think that's why the Foundry is so important because offering young professionals a platform and opportunity to speak about things that they care about is sort of foundational to sort of getting that network and also giving yourself a building step towards the rest of your career. And I think sort of jumping off of Mary's point that she said earlier about, you know, sort of tech policy being very US centric and honestly, very West, Western hemisphere centric, I think it'd be exciting to see what happens to the future of sort of young professional programs in terms of expanding to other parts of the world and understanding how tech policy and data privacy and some of these issues that we care about are manifested very differently in other parts of the world. So I think that's really important. Sort of like Brussels effect is very prevalent in discussions around like internet governance and 
sort of these international levels. And I think it can, it's easy to, for us to lose sight of like how some of these issues are different in the Southern hemisphere. So we'll see. I mean, it's always an exciting time. And I think there's something special about this field in that there's there's not one silo uh, that you know doesn't touch any other issue of tech policy. Everything is really kind of interconnected. So you can be a privacy wonk or an internet governance wonk uh, or a cybersecurity wonk, and maybe um, you know you're you're deep in that world and not super plugged into the other sub communities within tech policy. But, you know, I think they, they all do intersect and these issues um, require kind of interdisciplinary perspectives in order to create solutions to the, the problems that tech has created, but also the opportunities that it allows and in trying to find the best path forward. Um, that collaboration is is needed. And I think that's what the foundry is really here for and what makes it special is that it's this convening place of early in career professionals who are looking for places and spaces to make a difference of you know diverse backgrounds, diverse perspectives as as we all do, um, in not having, you know, one set path into into tech policy. Um, and I think that is what will make this field better. Um, and I think the podcast has also been uh, a place where we we try to convene those different viewpoints and um, and get you know a wide swath of people from different industries or different uh, different focus areas. In some ways, right, I mean, I think it was more unconventional a few years ago than it is now. I mean, I think the cat's out of the bag with tech policy now. And I think most places are paying attention to it. So that, right, so, but if you're a young professional, if you're either in, you know, in school, just out of school, you've been in, you know, you're working for a company or a civil society organization or something for a couple of years, right? A place like the Foundry, right, how can you build a portfolio? How can you stand out, right? Maybe you're too busy at your day job working on, you know, six or seven different projects, but maybe, you know, here there's an outlet for you. You can host that podcast. You can do that medium post or something like that, that really shows, you know, not only that you, you know, come to the table with a certain set of skills, but that you're building them throughout, you know, your two years, at the foundry. So it's interesting, right? It's not like, right, 10 years ago when I got into this, it was like, where are you going? Stakeholder what? Who? Um, yeah, it's not really the case anymore. Right? This is a, the market's going to be flooded with a lot of, you know, professionals looking to get into this, um, you know, this kind of arena, if you will. So, um, so a place like the foundry is a really good opportunity to, uh, to really build, you know, build your resume to use kind of a cliche term. Sorry, Mary, go ahead. Yeah, totally echoing what all three of you said. I think the Foundry is a great platform to start out in this space or even transition to tech policy um, because people may start in one field. For example, myself, I started in broader human rights field and then transitioned to technology and human rights. It happened before the Foundry, but I think Foundry also helped me delve deeper into some of the issues in US. Um, and I totally agree with Joe that it provides opportunities to do projects that you may not have time to do or the opportunity to do at your day job. And I think one of those is this podcast that we are chatting on right now. Um, and uh, I think it will be cool to hear more about uh, the history behind the podcast and what we did um, this year around it, what we achieved. And I would love to turn to Rima, our host, to walk us through um, the history and our achievements this year. Yeah, well, the, the great thing about the Foundry is we have 
this legacy of three prior classes to ours of fellows who have done amazing things with their careers and uh, and engaged in a lot of amazing projects when they were Foundry Fellows actively. Um, and one of those projects was the Tech Policy Grind uh, back in 2017 uh, when, it, when it all started. Um, Joe Jerome and Emery Roan and Pinal Shah uh, really launched the podcast and um, created it as the, the space in podcasting for um, young professionals in the tech policy space. Uh, and we, you know, had a bunch of episodes um, from, from their time and about two seasons. And then unfortunately, you know, with the, the coming of the pandemic and the transition um, from their class to the third class of Foundry Fellows, uh, the podcast fell off the map. And, you know, that happens with uh, human capital changes and whatnot. But uh, when we came in at the beginning of this year as the fourth class of Foundry Fellows, there was such a good energy uh, from the group of, hey, like, let's let's dig into the issues, like, let's do something, let's create content um, that really elevates the voices of our peers in this field. And that was something that I was immediately interested in in being a part of. Um, And so when the opportunity arose to, um, you know, kick something off the ground and, uh, and start up this podcast again, then you know, we, we jumped on it. And I think it's, it's been such a, a great um, experience to, to work with the three of you uh, in particular, but, you know, a whole host of other people who have worked on the podcast and contributed um, in, in some way. And so when we first were discussing, you know, how we were going to bring the tech policy grind back, a big part of the conversation was, you know, to, to Joe's point earlier on not having this hierarchical system and, um, and allowing everyone the opportunity to build out their skills um, and try podcasting, even if they've never done so before. Uh, we decided to follow a model where we would have a sort of rotating cast of characters who are conducting interviews and talking to people in their field um, talking to, you know, mentors of theirs, uh, talking to former fellows. And that was where, where it all started. Um, and Mary and Joe and Lama, the, the three of you, um, were some of the first to say, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was very much so a bias to action uh, model where we you know, got our, our podcasting platform set up. Um, and I was like, I've never, you know, edited a podcast before. I've, you know, much less been on one. Um, but we'll just try this and, and see how it works. And it's been a big experiment the whole time, but a really fun one. Um, and so, yeah, now here we are. And, you know, we've had so many different hosts uh, on on the show from uh, the four of us to Grant Versfeld, uh, Rebecca Kilberg, Dylan Brown Bramble, um, and, and a few others. But it's been, it's been a wonderful experience. Yeah. The, the podcast for me has been just really, really fun. I mean, I started, in radio when I was in undergrad. I mean, I wanted to be a radio host. At some point, my desire to not live in my parents' house outweighed my desire to become a radio host. But um, uh, it's always been, you know, kind of a a passion of mine. And and it's been really great to be able to to do that here. Um, So, you know, that that's something that that, that's just, uh, you know, really been great as as a fellow. 
I agree. Um, some of my earliest resources to finding uh, information about tech policy issues specifically have been podcasts. And so it was kind of nice to sort of see the the student becoming the master in a sense where I can host my own podcasts and talk about my own opinions about issues that I deeply care about and bring on people who have sort of inspired me to be the person that I am today. So it's nice to see things move full circle and also sort of like have that torch given to some of the younger voices and emerging people in the field because sooner or later we're going to be the experts. And so it's been a really incredible opportunity to have been given a platform to talk about these things early on. Um, and I'm excited for what happens next. Yeah, definitely. It was a very exciting experience. And I feel like we did an amazing job to just start working from day one uh, and have episodes going uh, you know, bi-weekly and then we went on weekly episodes which is a lot of work and big shout out to Rima on always being on top of things and to all of you uh, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you um, on this podcast it's a very interesting learning journey and I think we are not done yet but I'm really proud of what we have achieved and also the diversity of topics uh, and uh, perspectives that we have on the podcast, I think is a great resource for, um, you know, people trying to understand what is happening in tech policy in US and not only um, right now. Um, so I think I'm really excited to see where we go from here. Yeah, and I think one of the the most you know, fun parts about this experience and um, and the flexibility that we we have to experiment and innovate uh, with different formats is the the experimentation that we've done. Uh, you know, from going to conferences and chatting with people there, uh, from you know adopting virtual uh, sessions that we've done either with our hackathon series or with CyberCon, which we'll get into more, and to even doing live events and turning that into a podcast. Uh, it's been just a ton of fun. Um, and, you know, as far as live events, that is something that I have particularly found a lot of joy in uh, just after, you know, two-ish years of full-blown pandemic, um, being able to convene in person and have those those in-person conversations has been something. Um, and, you know, Joe and I had the opportunity to chat with Vint Cerf and Steve Crocker for our first ever live podcast, uh, hopefully the, the first of many. But Joe, do you want to dig into sort of the inception of that idea and how it all went. Yeah, um, you know, I think in my <laughs> my early days at ICANN consisted of uh, numerous oh shit moments, and many of which were being in the office and having these two gentlemen walk the halls <laughs> frequently, um, and kind of be like, oh, okay. First off, they're here. Second of all, somehow they remembered my name and, uh, you know, they're shaking my hand, right? It was just like a very, uh, you know, awestruck moments kind of early on. Um, and so when I was thinking about something that tech policy grind could tackle that was a little outside the box, if you will, not, not something that was necessarily a hardcore legal topic, but something that might just be kind of fun. Um, and so I, you know, I reached out and, uh, and, uh, and both, um, uh, you know, Vint and Steve, you know, agreed to, to do it. Um, and, you know, it's it just amazing. I mean, it was something that, that I had really, you know, been wanting to do for a very long time. And, and finally, you know, through the foundry, I was able to, to do it. Um, now, once they said yes, <laughs> that created another series of oh shit moments uh, as it relates to, okay, well, 
Foundry hasn't done an in-person event in two plus years. Does the equipment still work? Do we have a space? And oh yeah, it's August in Washington. Um, not exactly prime time for <laughs> in-person events. Um, so, you know, but I think we were able to, Rima, you and you and I, along with Tim and some of the other, uh, you know, Foundry fellows to, to work together and build a team that was able to to put a really impressive event together and i mean we we got more than 50 people in august i mean it's just like the second or third week of august there's not dc's a ghost town then i was i was you know um i was really impressed i was just really impressed with with the whole thing um from start to finish and it wound up being a great conversation and we we got to hear not only their take on tech in 2022 right from from two gentlemen who have been doing this since the 60s you know it's kind of interesting when you at the beginning of one of your sections of commentary you kind of took a swipe at southern california uh in terms of, of their level of awareness of tech policy which which uh you know is is true but also ironic in the fact that you know the first message on the internet came out of ucla um so you know, it's just kind of fascinating. Um, but we were able to hear, but you know, their kind of perspective on some of these current topics, but also hear the cool stories about them breaking into the lab, you know, and getting extra just so they could get, you know, extra lab time, computer time, uh, to start building this thing and start figuring this thing out and get kind of a, you know, you know, so we, we wound up spending what, like 90 minutes with them of, of, of talking about some of this stuff. And, and hopefully we can drop that in the notes so that people can go back and listen to it or, or watch it because we, we obviously uh, did video for that one, too. Um, but it was it was great. It was great to, to get everybody together to be in person, I think, you know, for the foundry to kind of reacquaint ourselves with live events and say, oh, yeah, you know what? This still works. We can still do this. Um, it was just it was just really great. I, I echo the sentiment. It was a great time. And we also saw you know, the bringing back of a couple of other projects and, and traditions of the Foundry um, in our annual policy hackathon. This was our third iteration. And I want to give a huge shout out to Dylan Brown Bramble, Donalyn Roberts, and Chris Frisella, as well as a huge team of people who worked very hard to make it come together. And Mary and Lemma, you were involved in that effort uh, in some capacity, uh, particularly with the series of side events that we did in the lead up to the hackathon. So what did planning the hackathon and its side events look like from Neil's perspective? Yeah, this year's hackathon was very interesting. I mean, the topic was all things privacy and trust and safety in the metaverse. So, you know, it's very hot topic, very interesting, but also challenging. And I think that in a way shaped the way that the planning and the event itself ended up being. Um, so I, as I said, I my first boundary event was this policy hackathon in 2020 and this year I switched gears to being part of the uh, planning committee so I mostly um, helped uh, the team look for resources or find mentors or judges and then I hosted the side event um, on privacy in the metaverse that uh, Rima and I moderated together um, and, and then I also um, interviewed the winning teams um, after uh, the hackathon was uh, completed. I think it was a very interesting perspective to be in the seat of an organizer uh, because there are so many things that you do not think about when you are just a participant in an event, uh, but you have a very different uh, angle and different priorities, I would say, or maybe different um, things you need to consider to make this a successful event. Um, and one thing I would say is that a policy hackathon is, is an experience that you sign up to be uncomfortable. And that is my message for future participants to 
come into this experience being more um, prepared uh, to be challenged and to be uncomfortable during this, um, you know, um, policy hackathon uh, event. Um, if you have that perspective, I think um, you enjoy it more and you challenge yourself more to come up with um, more innovative solutions uh, than if you just think of it as an exercise um, that you need to complete because you signed up for it. Uh, and definitely embracing the teamwork um, is crucial. Um, I mean, yes, technically you can do this um, alone too, or you know, a team of two is a team too, uh, but uh, definitely having different perspectives uh, enhances the, you know, the full experience. And also uh, I think you will come up with more interesting solutions. So overall, I think uh, I'm really happy what we um, achieved uh, in this space. And um, I think the, the fact that the topic was so new uh, was reflected not only during the policy hackathon itself but also during the side events because i remember during our panel for instance um, a lot of questions were answered well it's not here yet <laughs> so we don't know how things will look like we don't know if if you know what the situation will be we don't know if the current legal landscape is sufficient or not so we can it's we can speculate around it, but um, there are a lot of factors in play and we definitely need to see what the technology looks like to understand uh, the implications. So, yeah, I think um, it was a very uh, cool experience and definitely kudos to the whole team that made this happen throughout many, many months of planning and organizing. I echo Mary, especially because I was also in a similar situation where I was first a participant and then I was suddenly in the organizer's seat. Very, very different. There is a lot more planning that goes into a hackathon than what one might imagine. I think we were planning this competition since maybe the beginning of the year. Um, we were very early on identifying schools, finding career centers, reaching out to students contacting different professional organizations, asking people to participate um, because, you know, we've been doing the Zoom gig for a long time. And so sometimes it's hard to sort of really convince people to do this again and have uh, online connections. But the great thing about an online hackathon is that we get to meet people from all over the world that we otherwise wouldn't. I think we had participants from Africa, which is always really exciting and I think back to what Mary and I were saying earlier is that it's really important that we do get different perspectives that are not Western centric. And so our hackathon allows us to do that, which is incredibly exciting, but that also introduces the challenge of time zones. Um, but again, you have, you always have to come to these things getting ready to be challenged. And I think that's a great mindset to do it in. Um, in terms of, planning the side events, I ran the trust and safety in the metaverse webinar. And I have to say, I was really impressed by just the sheer amount of knowledge that so many people have in this space. Like when people talk about the metaverse, it's mostly like, oh, I don't really know what it is. Or they think of VR or AR or some of these more buzzwords, but there really are a lot of people who have, who, who have been sort of studying this and have been predicting this for a really long time. Um, and it's really interesting to see all these different perspectives. Um, some of the people that I had on my webinar, I knew through All Tech is Human or I knew through people at work. Um, and so it's one interesting to see all the different organizations that are sort of beginning to have working groups dedicated to this space. But two, the public is also really, really interested and very, very involved more than that I've seen previously. I think on our webinar, we had constant Q&A notifications pop up. Um, and the amount of information was so overwhelming that I wish we could have spoken for two or three hours. But I think the unique thing about the metaverse is that because it's so new and because it's so different and it's a, that it's being pushed by some of the most influential organizations in the space everybody wants a piece of it 
Um, and so I think it was really exciting how we centered our hackathon on that. Definitely. And I, for one, was a huge fan of um, just all the the variety of people who we had on um, through the side events and, you know, speaking to their expertise on these issues. And those are all um, podcast episodes that you can check out. Um, we'll link them in the show notes. Not too long after that, we also had our first ever CyberCon event. Um, Lama, do you want to dig into how that came together? Yes. So before I begin, <clears throat> really big shout out to you, Rima, um, Justin, Grant, Allison, and pretty much everyone that was involved in putting on this huge convention. It took a lot of work, a lot of planning, and just general passion for the field. And I think while it was stressful getting there, I think it was a great event worthwhile. We had so many participants um, and it was really exciting. So formally as a webinar expert, I think <laughs> this convention really allowed me to sort of showcase all the knowledge I had possible in order to execute the convention. Um, luckily it went smoothly aside from the casual like internet connections, but that's out of our own control. Um, but the idea was originally spearheaded by Justin, who leads our cybersecurity special interest group here at the Foundry, along with our president, Ricky George, who was also a panelist on our summit. Um, but essentially, everybody came together to sort of offer their ideas about what they would like to see in a cybersecurity convention. And I think the amazing thing about cybersecurity and why I enjoy it so much is because it is incredibly intersectional and it touches on almost every aspect of life from both the physical to the mental and sort of our day-to-day -day activities. And because of that, all the sort of topics that people were proposing touched on a variety of different things. So on the work aspect, Rima hosted a fantastic workshop on cyber hygiene for the legal profession. Whenever people think of cyber hygiene, it's very much like, oh, I should have like a nice password or I should change and use a password logger, but they don't really think about how that relates to the specific work that they do. In the legal field, you know, by your code of ethics, you're supposed to be able to protect your client and all your client's information. And so in the technology era, that's very much connected to your cyber hygiene. And so being able to host that session, I think, was incredibly worthwhile for a lot of people. And I know some people pinged me and said, this was a great session. I'm so glad that this was around. Like, I've been looking for this for a long time. So that was that was great. Um, and a topic that I didn't really know of, cyber insurance, which I know was going to possibly grow in the wake of ransomware attacks, was also very incredibly enlightening. Grant hosted that. Um, I think having a threat analysis landscape to sort of talk about some of the top headline news in cybersecurity was very helpful. Allison did a great job because, you know, we hear about cybersecurity attacks every day, so it can get kind of overwhelming trying to fish out what is most important. So I thought that was a great way to open our summit. And I think to end, it was also really helpful to sort of connect the idea of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, because we hosted this in October with Domestic Violence Month, and sort of being able to connect those two together and really emphasize the idea that cybersecurity does impact people on the physical level, and that does possess really big harms. And that's sort of why everyone should be an advocate for this space. Um, but of course, again, I was really impressed with just the knowledge of our speakers, how diligently and effectively all the fellows were hosting their sessions. Um, and also another big shout out to Rima because we were able to uh, partner with WESIS um, on putting on this event and we had just so many attendees and it was an incredible experience. So we're coming to the one year mark of our time as Foundry Fellows. We have another year to go um, but I think this could be a good time to chat over what the biggest highlight has been for, for each of us so far. So Joe, you want to start? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, and you had mentioned it earlier, uh, in the show, the convening power of the foundry, um, and that has been very impressive. Um, it was debatable uh to me whether or not that was still there um when we started 
out in January, right? Just not because of, um, you know, we did, there were just two years of, of just not a lot of activity, right? And there, um, you know, so can and a lot of these things, you know, just kind of like taking them off the shelf and dusting them off and seeing if seeing if they still work. And uh, and it, it turns out they do. Um, and and uh, uh, you know, credit to that. Uh, you know, certainly goes to, to, to this class of fellows, um, you know, for making that happen. Uh, you know, I think the, the reach of the podcast has been really impressive. Um, I think we've reached out to some communities that may have been unfamiliar, not only with the boundary, but with certain aspects and topics on tech policy, which I think is really cool. I think, um, you know, some of the, the events we just uh, discussed, you know, hackathon, cybercon, right? Some of these things, just really, really big, just interesting projects that, um, you know, uh, that in January of 2022, I wouldn't have necessarily said, oh yeah, that's going to happen this year. Um, but with, you know, expertise and hard work, it did. Um, that's really impressive. Yeah, really to echo Joe, being able to bring back things that were sort of dead um, because of the pandemic and the lack of resources and sort of figuring out how do you do a global national fellowship online? And I think the unique thing about our class is that we have been sort of navigating this landscape for the past two years. So we were really able to come with passion and drive and just different unique ideas to host things in sort of this hybrid work era. I think it was really great that we were able to sort of bring the podcast back to fruition. Um, I brag about it about every conference that I go to. People are like, oh my God, you like host a podcast? I'm like, yes, subscribe. And it's a great way to sort of talk about the foundry and um, it's becoming a household name in a lot of spaces that I'm in now. And it's just been really incredible to see it grow. And I think it doesn't stop here. I think it's just going to continue on. Um, and I'm also excited to see how we create new traditions um, and seeing those things um, progress, such as our CyberCon event. Yes, definitely echoing everything Lama and Joe said. Um, really excited to see that we started working from day one. And also want to echo what Joe said before uh, when he said that Foundry is what the fellows make out of it. Um, so I think we really, um, you know, decided to apply and become fellows. And then when that happened, we were like, okay, let's make this work. So I, my highlight for the year, in addition to bringing a lot of things back to life and creating new things, was the opportunity to work with really passionate um, people like the three of you. Um, because I feel like people don't really understand that the Foundry is a voluntary organization. So on one hand, it's cool. It's a voluntary organization. You don't have commitments, but on the other hand, it's a voluntary organization. This is not your main job. So you have a lot of other things or you may be in school. So, you know, really appreciate being appreciative of the fact that all of us found time uh, to make all of these things that we're discussing today possible is, one of the highlights for me for my first year at the Foundry. Y'all are tough acts to follow, but I guess that's the nature of <laughs> doing a round table with a bunch of podcast hosts. Um, but no, I, I fully agree with all of that. Um, and I think, yeah, for me, maybe even going back to the very beginning uh, when the opportunity arose to go to State of the Net um, as kind of the, the first main activity of the Foundry um, was really exciting for me. I had never been to, to DC before. Um, and I think, you know, when Tim Lorden reached out to, to all of us, all the, the new Foundry fellows and said, hey, you can come to State of the Net if you want, um, you know, it was definitely... I think he had in mind that it would be, you know, DC people who, who would show up, but I was like, yeah, you know what, 
<laughs> I'll um I'll head out from from my little LA bubble and um and try to see what this is all about. And I think that experience at State of the Net, um, that was when I met Lama for the first time. Um, uh, even before we had started on this whole uh podcast path together. Um but it was just a, an amazing experience to convene in that hub of tech policy folks, um, hear sort of the issues of the day, uh, hear from incredible speakers, and just meet all of the other, um, you know, early in career professionals who are interested in learning about this space and digging into the issues and digging into them in unique and novel ways. Um, so I am a big fan of State of the Net, um, a big fan of conferences in general and just opportunities to meet and convene with people. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity now to, to meet with each of you in person a couple of times. Uh, and, and that's been a huge highlight for me is um, just to get to know you all, uh, get to know so many other amazing folks from the Foundry. Um, I guess that's a good segue to what we can expect out of Foundry engagement at State of the Net uh, next year in early 2023. Joe, do you want to take that? Yeah, so I'm really excited about State of the Net. I always am. It's one of my favorite events of the year. Um, you know, for me, I mean, I'm based in D.C. and the lion's share of my work uh, at ICANN is U.S. and Canada focused. Um, so uh, State of the Net always, for me, sets the tone for the year in terms of kind of what are the conversations that are going to be happening? What is, you know, going to come across my desk or, you know, you know what other conversations are happening that might, um, you know, be top of mind for people in any given year. Um, for, you know, I see this, you know, we, we, had, we just got done, you know, talking for, you know, an hour about, you know, kind of, all the great stuff we did, which is true. Um, but I almost see 2023 state of the net a bit like a coming out party for the foundry in a way, almost reintroducing uh, ourselves and the program to uh, a very important swath of the tech policy community, which is you know, the DC based tech policy community. Um, because there's just, you know, and, and if listeners haven't been to the event before, it is just a, a convening of really smart, uh, important people from across the board, uh, you know, in business, government, civil society, uh, academia, and we're all in one place and we're all there you know, at the same time, and we're digesting the same information and, and, and talks and presentations. And then there's, you know, kind of the breaks, and we're all talking to each other. And, and, you know, so for the foundry, right, not having had kind of a official presence for a while, uh, you know, having us back there, I think would be is going to be really exciting. I think this uh, state of the net is going to be an even bigger deal, um, you know, than in previous years, right? There's a new Congress, so there's going to be a lot of different uh, personalities and different, you know, conversations that are going to be happening. Uh, but also just, you know, the city emerging or from the pandemic, uh, you know, and going back to in-person events, I mean, I was just downtown yesterday. It is definitely um, a lot more lively, right? People are getting out, people are going to these, these, you know, conferences and getting together and, and, you know, reacquainting themselves with, uh, with the community, which is really exciting. I think it's a really big opportunity for the foundry and for the fellows. Um, and so what we're hopefully going to do here in, in March is, 
is uh, re uh, resurrect this uh, tech policy grind at State of the Net, right? And so I actually have the podcast uh, broadcast, um, you know, live at State of the Net. And obviously it'll be, you know, uh, recorded so we can put it, you know, uh, on the, um, so people can listen to it afterward um, and talk to, you know, meet, some of our colleagues, right? Some other fellows, right? And talk to them, but also talk to some of the, you know, speakers that are at the conference at State of the Net and, and have some conversations about some of these big topics that are going to be, uh, you know, present uh, on, you know, Capitol Hill um, for the next 12 months, you know, from, from 2023 State of the Net until until 2024 state of the net and, and beyond. I am definitely excited for our engagement with the podcast um, at state of the net. And I think for our listeners, that is something to look forward to. We will be back. There will be a season four of the tech policy grind podcast, and we're going to kick it all off with, um, with some conversations from state of the net. So that is, something to get a little excited about. But there's also a lot of other plans and projects that we have for the Foundry next year. And if you've stuck with us this whole time um, and you're an early in career professional in the space, uh, or you know someone who is, and you have them in mind, um, you might be thinking, hey, like I wanna get involved. Um, and so there are, opportunities to get involved we want new voices in in the conversation and so we are launching um, a new model for how the foundry uh, is going to move forward so mary do you want to give us a preview on how the next class of fellows will be different than previous classes and, and how we're changing things up Sure. Um, well, I remember when we were starting out, uh, I was a bit surprised that Foundry has um, no specific structure, I would say. And also like looking at how the transition was going, um, you know, sparked some questions. And I remember me and you, Rima, we had a chat around this and we're wondering why is it that the Foundry um, class of fellows usually is for two years and uh, how this is usually going uh, because I think this is something we never thought about you know how the transition actually ends up happening and then having experienced that turbulence ourselves I think sparked the idea to change the way that the recruitment for the Foundry Fellows um, happens um, and um, I'm really happy that the board uh, went uh, forward with the idea to open up the application process, not uh, every other year, but make it an annual thing. And um, the idea is to have the previous class that started a year earlier as senior fellows and having the new um, folks as uh, junior fellows uh, so that there is more time to you know, make the transition and learn from each other and also literally network uh, because in a way, uh, of course, we meet other people that um, were Foundry Fellows in previous classes, but it feels like when your term ends, everybody moves on to doing other things. Uh, but this way, we may have the chance to have more synergy and, you know, maybe more opportunities to directly meet with different people. Also, just the fact that the next class will not have to... Um, figure out how to do everything at the foundry and, um, you know, have the real chance to meet the board members um, and, uh, you know, have quote unquote real elections for the board, uh, I think is something exciting to look forward to. Um, so I think this is another experiment that the foundry is doing right now to change the way that the fellow recruitment uh, will happen in the future and I'm sure we'll learn a lot throughout this process as well uh, but for now I think um, 
all of our listeners need to look at our website and consider applying. Um, once again, I think it's important to highlight, as we mentioned a lot throughout this episode, that there is space for everyone in tech policy because first, tech policy impacts everyone, whether you think about it that way or you don't. Uh, and we need everyone's voices here. And tech policy is a very intersectional field. And the more people from different backgrounds get involved, the better the space and the policy making will end up being. Um, and as we said a lot here, again, I think the foundry is an exceptional opportunity to transition to this space or start out as um, a tech policy professional. And I think we all are very excited to see uh, who will apply and to welcome new fellows to the foundry. So yeah, definitely consider applying. And if you want to chat about it before applying, I think if this one hour of this podcast was not enough, then I think all of us will be happy to chat um, privately about the foundry as well. Definitely. I am always talking folks ears off about uh, about how much of an incredible impact uh, the foundry has had on my life, the amazing people uh, I've been able to meet and we want to meet you. So please do check out our website. I will leave the, the link in the show notes uh, for you to, to check out. Um, but you can also check out our social media pages for uh, updates on application deadlines and whatnot. Um, alrighty. Lama, Joe, Mary, thank you all so much for coming together and doing this year in review of our first year as fellows at the Foundry. It's been a ton of fun working with y'all um, and a ton of fun having this conversation as well. Uh, so I'm excited for, for the future and to see um, all that we'll achieve in 2023. And Happy New Year to everyone listening. Thanks again, Rima. Always a pleasure. Happy New Year to everyone. And we hope to see some of you at State of the Net next year. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, looking forward to an exciting 2023 and happy holidays. Thanks, all. Get some rest. Be ready to go. <laughs> January 2023. <laughs> <laughs>